have uh, this session uh, with uh, my co-chair, Dr. Ahmed Zahrani. Dr. Ahmed Zahrani is a consultant medical oncology at King um, uh, Faisal Specialist Hospital, and he is a prominent GI oncologist. Today, we will, our topic is about challenging cases, and we have three of uh, brilliant oncologists who will present uh, difficult cases. I'll start with the first one. My co-director, Dr. Kenan Shammari, um, consultant medical oncology as National Guard, and also uh, he's um, interested in phase one uh, um, clinical trial. He will present a difficult case about hepatocellular carcinoma. Kenan? It's ready. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashwag, for the introduction. Uh, so I was given the task to uh, choose a challenging case, and I hope that I will present a uh, challenging case of hepatocellular carcinoma. So I was referred a, an 80-year-old gentleman who was actually referred to my clinic uh, by the hepatology service. He actually initially presented to them as a liver mass initially for investigation. He does have a background of cirrhosis, um, non-hepatitis B or C, so it's possibly nationally I put. He, also, he is also known to have diet control <clears throat> diabetes and hypertension. He does take him lodipine 10 milligrams daily, nothing else. He is not known to have any drug allergies. So he was initially referred from a peripheral hospital with an abdomen ultrasound showing this liver mass after he actually presented with some abdominal pain. The hepatologists have seen him. They started the workup. They ordered hepatitis serology, which came back as negative. They also ordered a triphasic CT, which showed a cirrhotic liver with multiple liver masses. Uh, some of them were LIRAD5. Uh, others were not typical of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is the baseline uh, image. Let me see if I can move my mouse. So this is a clear mass. Here is another one. And I think here is another one. Uh, but that's a single cut of uh, the abdomen CT. So he was brought forward by our hepatology group in our uh, HCC tumor board. He was initially not found to be suitable for local regional therapy nor surgery. He was referred to medical oncology for the possibility of initiation of systemic therapy. So this 80-year-old gentleman came to my clinic. His performance status was zero. His child Pew score was 5A. I requested the CT chest to uh, see uh, or to fully staged him. And this showed a single right upper lobe mass, which was five centimeters in diameter. This is the mass here. So it's a single lesion that is of decent size, five centimeters, no other lung masses. So probably the initial thought process is, initially the hepatologist thought that this could be metastasis from the HCC. Um, however, I have discussed with uh, some radiology, uh, radiologist colleagues of mine, and it is unusual to have just a single large lesion in someone who's 80 who presents with uh, such presentation. So I actually um, biopsied this lesion and it came back as neuroendocrine carcinoma uh, of small cell type with a high KI67 of more than 70%. Um, now, multiple radiologists' opinion, now these are uh, our abdomen uh, radiologists, uh, is that some of the uh, metastatic or some of the liver lesions are actually metastatic from the neuroendocrine carcinoma. The rest were the LIRAD5 ones, were the HCC ones. So how do we approach such a case? So we have two cancers. They are synchronous double primaries. Both of them are metastatic. Is there a potential of cure? I don't think so. So is there an impending risk or what's the priority approach? Now I'm gonna discuss this in the next few slides. So I have taken him forward to our hepatobiliary uh, meeting, which we already discussed. I've also taken him to our thoracic tumor boards. Uh, I also discussed him with some of my thoracic oncology colleagues. 
Now, just as a general approach, how do we actually approach patients with double primates that are metastatic? In terms of prioritization uh, of risk, he does have a risk of death from his neuroendocrine carcinoma, that is small cell type with high KI67, that is quite aggressive. There's also a risk of progressing in terms of his hepatoma. There is also a risk of decompensating of his cirrhosis. He's currently child five, luckily. However, this, this is always a risk, um, and my colleagues who treat HCC know this. So, I have taken him to two MDTs. The collective decision and the provisional plan was that he is not for any local regional therapy of front with the presence of neuroendocrine carcinoma. He does need some form of systemic therapy, and we should select systemic therapy that has some potential to cover for both neuroendocrine carcinoma and hepatoma. We need to probably do early reassessment CT scans, so probably uh, eight weeks or so, to check for response and change the plan accordingly. All of the above was explained to this patient and his son who agreed on this provisional plan. So a very nice review article that speaks about how to approach multiple primary tumors. I actually want to spend a few minutes talking about this because I think this is one of the um, uh, objectives of, of, of this presentation. So when approached with two different malignancies, so double, double malignancies in a single patient, we always have to think about, is there a genetic predisposition? In now, having a prior cancer is a major risk factor for developing subsequent cancers. Prior therapies uh, against cancer are, are also uh, risk factors to developing cancers. Some chemotherapeutic agents are well known to cause certain hematological malignancies. Prior radiotherapy can cause certain sarcomas and other uh, uh, cancers. Certain lifestyle factors can actually be risk factors for more than one cancer. Examples are alcohol, smoking, obesity, and others. Um, multiple studies have actually looked at the frequency of multiple primaries, and these have actually ranged between 2% um, up to even 10% of, of uh, databases uh, with patients actually presenting with uh, at least a double primary. So it's not that uncommon. Now, how do we approach patients with synchronous multiple primaries? Again, we should discuss them in multidisciplinary team meetings and a consensus decision on a uh, therapeutic strategy can sometimes come from uh, not one MDT, from multiple. Also, the patient should be informed about the situation and should be um, uh, involved in the decision. Uh, he should be aware or they should be aware about the therapeutic challenges and, and sometimes the uncertainty about the prognosis. Now, when we are approached with two localized disease, the strategy could be radical. We can think about surgery, radiation, or chemoradiation to cover both malignancies. However, when the situation is that of an advanced disease, we sh should think about some form of systemic therapy. Um, it may be difficult because most of these systemic therapies that cover for two cancers are not really based on uh, strong evidence from literature and clinical trials. Now, how do we actually approach cases when we think about systemic therapy? Our first question that we should probably ask, which is, um, which is the most significant tumor for the prognosis? What is the most aggressive? Is there a chance of a curative approach or is it a purely palliative approach? If it is a palliative approach and the tumor is already metastasized, what about the tumor dynamics? Which one is likely to grow faster? Um, and what are the systemic therapy options that would cover for both types of malignancies? Um, and we should always think about whether we should start our systemic therapies altogether up front, or if we should think about a sequential type of therapy. We should also think about that may be anticipated. So in colorectal cancer with other primaries, do we need to think about a possible bowel obstruction happening. In patients with hepatoma or with multiple liver metastases, doing tumor profiling. Now, I know this is not available in many hospitals, but it is definitely helpful and can go certain mutation that eat it, uh, and help the dual cancers. Now, if a systemic therapy is necessary, can a regimen be chosen that 
that is active for both diagnoses? If not, what are the potential interactions between the two anti-tumor regimens? Some of them would activate your CYP uh, 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 enzymes, some of them are known to prolong your QT. Is there uh, additive toxicity of adding both of these together? Now, one of the other approaches that I actually found in literature is that can the pregnancies be treated in a cycling manner? So systemic therapy for tumor A, so perhaps systemic therapy for the neuroendocrine followed by a few cycles of systemic therapy for tumor B. That's one approach. So back to our case. Now, what are the current therapeutic regimens for small cell lung cancer? Now, I'm not a thoracic oncologist. However, this is, this is widely available in literature. So platinum doublets plus durvalumab and platinum doublets plus atezolizumab have uh, recently been reported in literature. And the addition of uh, immuno-oncology or PD-L, PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors to platinum doublets have shown an, improve, an improvement in overall survival. Now, in our case specifically, what sort of anti-hepatoma therapy can we add? Is there any evidence of adding tyrosine kinase inhibitor to platinum doublets? Would we worry about toxicity? I probably would. Is there an evidence of an adding an anti-VEGF agent with the platinum doublets? Are there other active agents that we can formulate in such case? So I discussed with our patient that he has two primaries. His performance status was excellent. Despite being 80 years old, he, his performance status was actually zero. His liver function tests were preserved. He was child A. Now, hepatologists have uh, thankfully done an EGD prior to the referral, and they have shown that he has grade one esophageal varices. So I started him on carboplatin, etoposide, and atezolizumab. The reason I chose this is carboplatin and etoposide would cover the neuroendocrine carcinoma. Atezolizumab would also cover for that, um, treating it as if it was small cell lung cancer, and it has an anti-HCC uh, uh, effect. So I gave him three cycles, then I re-imaged him. So the first CT showed a mixed response with the lung neuroendocrine carcinoma having had a partial response. And some of the liver lesions were actually larger, some of them were actually smaller. I discussed with two of my colleague radiologists and their impression was that, a that, that the metastatic neuroendocrine carcinoma to the liver lesions, these were the ones that were smaller. However, his HCC progressed. There was a suggestion to do a choline PET CT. However, it was not available at, at that time. So I took him back to our hepatobiliary tumor board. His performance status remained excellent. And the interventional radiology group have actually agreed to offer him palliative transarterial radioembolization to control his hepatoma. Now, what I wanted to actually show here is that I actually think that this is an excellent report. This was done by one of my dear colleagues, uh, consultant radiology colleagues. And I actually want to read it um, uh, 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 to you guys. So his impression now, the report is much longer than this. However, this is the summary. Received three cycles of chemo and immunotherapy for a neuroendocrine tumor and HCC. Uh, early cirrhotic liver with an uptrending protein from 650 to 1,100. The hepatic lesions show different behavior on current study with different response to the treatment as show, some show response with viable enhancing component and others have an increase in size without an internal enhancement and they are new hypervascular lesions. We believe that large lesions are neuroendocrine tumors, while the smaller hypervascular ones are HCCs. Now, this is what I really think is a helpful report, where the radiologist would actually look at biomarkers, such as alpha fetoprotein, and would give us a helpful impression. Back to our case. So he had his first session of a sequential or a staged tear. Now, with his hepatoma progressing, his neuroendocrine carcinoma improving, I actually stopped his atezolizumab. And I started him on ramisurumab plus carboplatin and etoposide. Now, the reason I gave him anti-VEGF, high alpha fetoprotein, it is an active agent against HCC. And there, we can add it to uh, platinum doublets. I, and probably I wouldn't feel as comfortable adding a TKI uh, as opposed to adding uh, an anti-VEGF agent. And his alpha fetoprotein was actually quite high. 
So I gave him three more cycles of carboplatinitoposide and ramucirumab, plus we interrupted in the middle and gave him a second session of tear. Now he came back to me, uh, I think just before Eid in July. Luckily, he actually achieved a complete response in his liver. So both the neuroendocrine component and his HC component, uh, he achieved a, a complete response in that. And he had a remarkable partial response in his lung lesion with a significant reduction in size with the presence of a small residual. So I took him back to our thoracic multidisciplinary team and I discussed with one of our radiation oncologists who agreed to offer him consolidative radiotherapy to the lung lesion. He stopped his therapy after six cycles and he is currently receiving radiotherapy, consolidative radiotherapy to the remnant of his lung lesion. It's currently ongoing. So um, what may be the discussion points? Um, should we have biopsied his liver lesions initially? I do believe so. I took this to our interventional radiologist. However, we had a long discussion which ended up by them not wanting to do that. Uh, would a choline PET CT have benefited us? I think so, because it would show us if uh, which um, subtype of liver lesions would have progressed. What would be the best systemic therapy regimen for these two primaries? Um, I think I've shown that. And what would be the best second line therapy for HCC when given in conjunction with carboplatinotoposide? I think the lessons learned from this case is that concomitant malignancies require careful planning and prioritization of therapy. Input from different services is essential. In my case, we took input from interventional radiology, radiation oncology, our radiologist colleagues and others. Sequencing therapy based on prioritization is essential and checking the patient tolerance. Luckily, his performance status was zero despite him being 80. And we did sequence based on prioritization, tackling the neuroendocrine component, uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma component initially. When these are done successfully, they can yield excellent results, such as I hope in our patient. And by that, I conclude. Thank you. Ahmed, do you want to present the next? Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Tanhan, for nice and elegant uh, uh, illustrative case. Um, it's a very challenging case. We will keep the question uh, at the end of the session. Uh, it meant this session uh, meant to be interactive. So uh, please, throughout the discussion, uh, please uh, post your question in Q&A chat box and will be addressed accordingly. Uh, 